Welcome to the Four Everyday Leaders podcast. Brandon Faust, Alex Holt here with you today. Alex, tell us what the podcast is all about. Yeah, this podcast is all about helping people lead in the everyday spaces and moments of life. And today on the show, we have with us a dear friend of ours. A dear friend. Dear friend. A dear friend. Joel Larison. Joel is a church planter. He is the lead pastor at Bridgeway Church up in Kokomo, Indiana. He is one of the hosts at the Atypical Talk podcast. He's a husband and a dad of two sweet and wild boys. Before we get to our great conversation, with Joel. Uh, this episode of the Four Everyday Leaders podcast is sponsored by Ascend Roofing. The team at Ascend are a perfect sponsor for this podcast as they embody everyday leadership in their business. They're locally owned and operated, and Ascend Roofing has more than a decade of focused residential roofing experience, and they service the greater Indianapolis area. I've personally had Ascend Roofing come out to my house, and they went above and beyond my expectations. So whether it's to respond to severe weather or it's just time for a new roof, Visit their website, AscendRoofingLLC.com. That's A-S-C-E-N-D, RoofingLLC.com. Joel, our dear friend, Joel. Dear friend. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for making the track. Oh, man. It is an honor to be with you guys. A big fan of the podcast, so it's really cool to jump on and have these conversations with you. Thanks, man. Joel and I met in college in Hudson Hall, and I just remember there was a guy playing guitar very well, uh, very well. Decent. Joel's a great musician, mm. and uh, especially at that time, and I would say it still holds true, but I give him a break. I was like, is that John Mayer sitting in the lobby playing guitar? Yes. And uh, I would always say that to Joel to get under his skin, but it was also true. And then when you would play John Mayer, it was like, no, that that oh, that sounds like uh, that it sounds was, like John Mayer. It was like dreams. Um, I, I make slightly even less attractive faces when I sing than John Mayer does. Wow. Just naturally, because I'm less attractive, so it works out really well. But and and Joel, Joel and I's claim to fame together was we would play in the B-team chapel, oh. which was like there was an overflow chapel, and it was acoustic only, and Joel and I, we'd get some guys scrounged together. B-team. B-team. B-team for Jesus. B-team that for was Jesus. what it was. Wow. It was, man. In like the old, oh. this old, like oh. old chapel. Dilapidated. Build, yes. It, like oh. Condemned building. It just felt so new. New Testament. <laughs> wow. wow. So Joel, Joel and I, we were friends in, in school, and then we've stayed friends since then, right? Um, mm-hmm. At times, you know, you would come over and lead worship for stuff that we were doing for some ministry programs and things like that, or speak at things, and vice versa, and mm-hmm. um, we just stayed friends, and you, uh, I remember sitting with you, uh, was that like fall of 19 probably? Yeah, it was probably yeah, but, late summer of 19. Yeah, and you were like, hey, I'm going to plant this church in Kokomo. And um, and so I've gotten the opportunity to be involved with some of the front end of, of some of that stuff. And I'm um, just watching you continue just to be who you are, who you've always been. Uh, great character and then just a heart for Kokomo of, you know, there's all these other places in the world. But, you know, it's it's, it's always a special, unique thing when you kind of stay and remain in your hometown and yeah. serve. Yeah. And, um, I feel like you, between you and your brother, you guys are making like all kinds of impact in that, the Kokomo area. Well, it's, it's, it's cool. interesting because everyone has a complicated relationship with your hometown, right? Yep. Because mm-hmm. there's this deeply human thing where it's like, oh, I want to prove myself that I can, you know, get out and do things. And, and so it's, it's complicated in that regard. Um, and, you know, you've had different seasons when I felt like that itch to go prove myself and do things, and I've had opportunities to do so, but there's also a unique nature to your hometown um, where you understand it, yeah. yes. and you have deep yeah. connections with multiple generations of people yeah. to where you don't have to think like a missionary parachuting in, but you're like, oh, I get this town, I understand the heartbeat, yeah. I and I love the potential, and um, that's what I love about doing ministry in my hometown. Hmm. It's, yeah. it's a unique thing. That, that is unique. Cool. That's awesome. I love it. So tell us, all right, you grew up in Kokomo. We know that. Spoiler alert. But tell what was life kind of like for you growing up? And then how did you kind of get on this path towards vocational ministry and all that? Well, um, I grew up going to a small kind of family style church. Um, I was in church whenever the, the doors were open. My parents, it was, it was just a part of how we did life. And I love church. I'd say overall my experience in church was a healthy uh, thing that, was beneficial to me. Uh, I don't have a lot of like church hurt and trauma from growing up in church. And I started serving um, early because my grandma would sing and uh, <laughs> she, and I like music. So she'd get me to sing these terrible, like gospel, Southern gospel quartets, quartet songs with her. Yes. And uh, they're so embarrassing. I hope there's no footage online, <laughs> but I couldn't say no to my grandma. Are you, are you a bass or a tenor? Uh, oh, I, 
I was everything that was needed, but mm, I was more of a tenor. Yes. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> and so then I started playing bass when the church moved to like hmm. a praise band yep, style. Yes. So I would play bass, not regular guitar, because there's only four strings on a bass. You only have to hit one at a time. So I did that. So I was used to like getting there early and serving mm. and being sort of on the inside of helping people. And um, I never thought that ministry, like in a vocational sense, would be a part of my story. Um, because um, I, I really, I wanted to like make a lot of money and I wanted to have like a high powered kind of situation going on. I mean, my mom told me at a young age that I was either gonna be a lawyer or a preacher because I was gonna mm. use my mouth to get me in trouble or do a lot of good. Mm. And um, mm. I, I went to college actually um, to study pre-law and political science. I didn't know that. Yeah, wow. so uh, I went to school thinking I was going to be a lawyer and I went to a Christian school to do pre-law because I thought it would at least keep me from going to the dark side. Uh, <laughs> not that that would ever actually do that. But um, but then, you know, I was serving at a local church on the weekends in a mm -hmm. student ministry, and I was driving back and forth um, between Kokomo and where I was going to school. And I just, one night I got back uh, on a Sunday night after serving the student ministry, and I had my like wrestling with God kind of moment yeah. to where I could not stop <laughs> thinking about like, man, what if I could like do this forever? What if I could help people and help students and help people realize that, Jesus is more than a concept. He's more mm. than just you know a character in an old story, mm. but he's real and he can change your life. And he's inviting you into something. And um, it was almost like that next week I had a mentor speak to me and speak four powerful letters or four mm. powerful words I see in you mm. um, mm -hmm. that you know you could walk this path and you can make a mm. difference and you can use these skills to help um, other people find their identity and their purpose in Jesus and. It was sort of my, my my green light, and I just I couldn't stop thinking about it. Changed my major the next week I could, and I was sort of off to the races in that mm. way. So wrestled with uh, what I thought my life was going to be, but then surrendering it over to Jesus. And um, man, I've never never regretted mm. what that has done in mm. my life. And yeah. yeah. Mm. So how you know on this pathway, then what did that look like after you know school wrapped up? And because um, I think we were kind of at that time, kind of similar parallels in the sense of like I was going back to my hometown to serve at, a, at, at the church that I grew up in, and you were going back to your hometown. How did that all transpire? And then how did you end up planning a church, man? Yeah, um, it was a series of opportunities and permissions, and me saying yes to the unknown. Mm -hmm. Overall, I mean, I was in. I started, you know. I came on staff at a church I was serving in in college, and I started in one role, and, and seven years later, I'd had four different roles. Mm. And um, it was a great permission giving culture to where it was, hey, are you interested in this? Do you want to mm. try out this skill? Mm. You never felt pigeonholed in one thing, but mm -hmm. it was who did God make you to be, yeah. and how can you serve the body? And uh, so, you know, I did. I was doing worship ministry and student ministry. Then I was doing worship ministry and adult ministry. And then I moved into leading student ministry and communicating and leading a team to leading groups and discipleship to leading a campus mm -hmm. and leading a staff team in that way. And it was just a series of, okay, I, I'm an Enneagram 8, so I love a challenge yeah. and I love uh, the idea of a hill to climb and going mm -hmm. there and saying yes in the moment and having people ahead of me, beside me, above me that believe that um, to take a chance. And so from there, yeah. um, there was a transition uh, in that church and in, in our family to where um, I was actually looking at doing ministry in other places across the country, doing, um, I had some opportunities um, in different places. And so we were thinking about moving, fresh mm. start. And I just had a series of uh, interactions with people over the course of two weeks where I just felt so plain and clear that um, I wasn't done in that community mm -hmm, yeah. and that God was still calling me to a unique work in a different kind of seat. Mm -hmm. And that led to uh, us sort of putting this crazy idea out on Facebook that, hey, we're going to start a church and, you know, the next year. And, uh, and we called it Bridgeway because we wanted to connect the irreligious to the real Jesus. And we wanted to connect every generation to the life of mm -hmm. Jesus that he had for them. And uh, so, yeah, we started a pre-launch season and we launched in perfect timing of March 8th, 2020, with all the <laughs> excitement in the time. world, our grand opening four days before the world shut down and changed forever. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm. Wow. What on all that in that journey? Because I think, regardless of if someone's career is in 
like pastoral vocational ministry or whatever, I think that a lot of times um, we think once we're done with like college or maybe you skip college and you're you know done with high school, you think, man, I've just got to be in my sweet spot immediately, yeah. right? Or maybe like you super. I mean, Joel's being humble. Joel's an incredible musician. And I think a lot of people have just been like, hey, this guy can just play music at churches or whatever for the next, you know, 30 years. Um, but what were some of those things that you're like, hey, I love to uh, try something new. Yeah. I love to act like learning what these skills are that I have besides just playing music. Like how did things from music to communicating a message to coming around and caring for people like talk about that growth and that that pliability of that skill set and trying new things. And was there anything that you tried and you were like, Nope, not for me. Um, yeah, yeah, there were, there were definitely those along the way, right. Where there's just skills that don't transfer. I think for me, one of the, one of the axioms I try to live by and I try to w do my work through is that it's always about people. And when, right. if I could like, uh, if I could like take a, you know, a stream or sightline through a lot of the things I've done, I've, I've always wanted to impact people, and I can do that in lots of different ways. Creatively, music can be something that can move people mm -hmm. and connect them to a bigger story. Um, but it was really in that idea of connecting people to a bigger story yeah. that is carried through everything. Mm -hmm. And so I can do that in a lot of different ways, whether that be connecting them into community, whether that be in pastoral counseling and shepherding mm -hmm. and walking with somebody mm -hmm. and music and communicating and teaching and preaching. That's what I'm always trying to do is connect mm -hmm. them and their story to this bigger story that mm -hmm. God's been writing since the yeah. beginning. Um, and that's what we're trying to do with our faith community at Bridgeway yeah. as well. So. There were things along the way where I'm like, oh, that's not exactly what I'm, you know, uniquely gifted at. But that sightline of trying to connect people to this bigger story mm. is something that's just been in my blood and in my bones forever. That's cool, man. Yeah, that's really good. So talk about that journey of planting this church, planting it on the Sunday before the world shuts down, and the journey and the leadership journey that you had to go through of like, okay, now we're. Uh, I think you said it well before, like, we've got to go underground. We're going to do this whole digital thing. We're not going to be physically with people. And in that physical relationship connection, which is such a, I think, critical part of, like, the gathering of the body, talk about that journey that you and your team went on as you continued to lead this brand new church. Yeah. Uh, man, you pull me back to the dark times. I know. I feel. No, no, I but know. this is so good because I, I think um, I learned so much about myself and I learned so much about leadership in crisis just in the midst of it, right? Yeah. I mean, there was no book, there was no handbook or seminary text for how to do this <laughs> yeah. and do this well. Yeah. So we, um, we on March 8th, 2020, we were overwhelmed by the people that came to our opening. We had standing room only. We had baptized four people that morning that had joined us sort of as our launch team and became Jesus followers during that pre-launch period. We ordered 75 more chairs because we were just like, here we go. We're going to have to go to three services in two mm -hmm. weeks or whatever. We were like, what is going to happen? And uh, then, you know, the NCA shuts down their the tournament and March Madness. And then the NBA shuts down their season. You can't meet with more than mm -hmm. 10 people in a room. We're like, what in the world are we doing? Yeah. And I mean, honestly, like I had my like crying in the shower moments. Like, what have I done? Like, yeah. uh, what are we going to do? Did we, do we even have a church? We just did a service. And yeah. what's this mean next? And we had invested and raised a bunch of money to do physical environments that we could not use for six months. Yeah. We invested nothing in the digital. Digital was in our like year three plan to like mm -hmm. <laughs> figure mm -hmm. out. So it, it was like this moment where I, I was like, I was devastated, but I, I knew that in the uncertainty, I wanted to be guided by values and yeah. I wanted to be guided by, um, you know, my personality, the way that God's wired me to like, just do something. And if I'm gonna fail, I want to fail forward, and I want to be I want to be driven by values and who we want to be as a community, and just do the small things there, yeah, and lead people forward. So I remember, even in March, uh, one of our values at our church is that we want to be irrationally uh, generous to our community, um, not just talk about it, but mm -hmm. be about it. And so I remember um, trying to go around and using some of our funds and raising some funds from people in our church to like go buy meals for some nursing home staff and some uh, bring pizza to some hospitals and things like that. And we would just share those stories and be like, here's yeah. a way that we can be activated. We can't gather together in this way, but we can move forward with our mission still. Mm -hmm. And it, it gauged a lot of excitement. Yeah. Um, 
the next thing we did was um, I put my iPhone up on a couple cardboard boxes and I just recorded myself giving a sermon and we posted it on Sunday morning. Uh, and we did that for probably three months before we even bought a real camera and it was so janky, but it put us out there <laughs> yeah. in a way and we had our launch team share it like crazy and man, we probably have a hundred people that are part of our community now because we were out in that marketplace of ideas. Now, yeah. did it look great? No. Um, was it the quality that we wanted? No, but we were going to fall forward with, yeah. we want to get out there and share yeah. the hope that people mm -hmm. really need in that moment mm. in that time. Well, I think that's so like critical for leaders to understand when we face moments of uncertainty, when we face moments of crisis in our leadership, whether it's a global pandemic or like just a really bad day and a really critical decision, like how we respond to that so greatly determines what our next step will be and what yeah. the future looks like for us in our leadership. And that idea of being willing to fail forward is I think just such a, a practical principle for all of us to learn. Well, yeah, whether it's some a new rhythm or a practice in your home whether it's in your workplace, whether it's somewhere that you're serving and you have this, or maybe this like blossoming idea of something you've always mm -hmm. wanted to bring into the world and starting a, a side hustle or a podcast or a business or a blog or, or, or whatever, um, yeah. a nonprofit, whatever it might be to sometimes just say like, Hey, um, you know, you, you can't do this improvement iteration unless there's a gen zero, like, right. unless like you, there's actually something that's there, yeah. you know, going from, from here into reality. And obviously you want to use wisdom in that and not be reckless, but sometimes it means like, what's your, like, get the phone out and record a sermon message, yeah. right? Like, what is that for you? Yep. Um, and I would just encourage our listeners, it doesn't have to be like in leading a church or leading a business or yeah. leading some other entity or whatever. It might just be, hey, here's this new thing I wanted to try with our kids at bedtime. Yep. And you're like, I'm afraid I'm going to look silly or this is going to be stupid or not sustain it. Like sometimes we just have to go and give it a whirl and fail forward. And I think that's yeah. such a good reminder. I was talking to a leader friend of mine the other day and I, he and I were just talking about dreams of ours and and he was asking me a question and he said why are you like why are you waiting to start your dream whatever it is uh until three or four years from now he's like why not start it tomorrow he said the fear is always going to be there the the failure option is always going to be there like why not just start tomorrow and take a step toward yeah. it mm -hmm. um and i thought that was just such good wisdom and advice yeah. of like we've just got to sometimes try and do and it's not going to be perfect but you're right we We've got to have a, a Gen Zero to get something started. I think inside of that, too, um, I think we're so often afraid to just do a pilot program, to yes. just try it. And and that's something that I don't know why I don't have that fear. I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, let's try it, and we'll build it while it's in mid air mm -hmm. and yep. it might fail, but like we're at least trying it, and we're trying to do something. I mean, early on, before we and we'd had one service, but I'm like, hey, let's start some like uh, we call them table groups, small groups, life groups. Let's do some Zoom groups to where we can just connect some people yeah. together when we're all stuck at home. And we did it for three or four weeks, and you know we had I think 25 people come to it. I wanted a lot more, and it didn't really work the way that we wanted. But I think people saw the values that we had that we're not just going to be a church that's about yeah. a Sunday morning show. We're going to mm -hmm. be about community and connection. Mm -hmm. And that value was put out there. And as long as you're guided by your values, try and fail, yeah. fail forward. Don't wait till you have all your ducks in a row. Because the reality is we never have all our ducks in a row. And there's always <laughs> well, and, trivia and, that pops up. And if and if there's this idea that's been or a stone that's been put in our shoe and something that we just have to do something about yep. that matters to us in, in some sort of way. Um, we might be robbing other people mm. of their gifts if we don't if we have so the good. idea and we don't bring so it good. out. So good. And then that like collaboration of like the improver, right? Like the person who is super gifted at like optimizing and operationalizing things that yeah. that need it or giving feedback. Like if we if we have the idea in here, you know, it's it's actually becomes bad stewardship if we don't put it out. And yeah. th and those were some of the things that I think for me in those like years of 2015, 2016 wrestling, like how can I be, how do I steward my life the best that I can? Mm, yeah. And I remember sitting with a, a leader who was uh, going through retirement he was in his sixties and he's like, now I can just go around and invest in leaders like I always wanted to. And I just remember literally, I said out loud to him in that moment, I said, would you advise me to do the same thing? Like, would you advise me to wait until my 60s we'll do to do what I really wanted to yeah. do? Because he was like, that's the one thing I kind of regret. And he's like, do it now as soon as you can. Wow. Yeah. Like if you if that's what you're grabbed, like figure it out. And, um, you know, in the last few years, that's kind of the path that God's 
had us on. It's part of the reason why we have this podcast and all those yeah. things. But like sometimes, um, you know, the courage just to fearfully tread out there and, and do it. And then there will be people who help and let's not rob them of the opportunity to yeah. do that. Right. So, um, Joel, talk to us, you know, you have this atypical talk podcast that's launched recently. Um, and it's been, it's been awesome. Like you guys oh, have thanks, done a man. great job. Yeah. I, I do listen. Um, but to talk to us about, you know, so much of that podcast and, and just kind of who you are, like throughout the years, Joel is always kind of like, engaging the culture mm-hmm. just like who he is he understands i think you always have this level of empathy with you just as a human mm-hmm. and as a leader but talk about like in this you know especially these last couple of years but even in this last month you know um this summer in 2022 about this critical intersection of faith and culture and how and why do we get? Why should it matter to us? Yeah. Um, what does it mean to be a Christian in this moment and to lean in into these um, these moments and these conversations and um, just talk, just share your heart a little bit on that and maybe some nuggets that we could extract. Yeah. Well, atypical talk really was birthed from conversations that I would just find myself having with friends, friends like you and other ministry minded people. Sometimes people that aren't even people of faith. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think people have this um, misnomer that the world is sac- sacred and secular, mm, and there's yeah. this divide between mm-hmm. the two, and there can't be a bleed over, and there can't be this blend. And I just don't see the world that way, probably from just a lot of my influences and just the way that I've grown and questioned and wrestled with Christianity. Because um, I think that the person of Jesus and historical Christian faith and the scriptures are relevant to every area mm, of yeah. mm-hmm. culture in our lives. And I think in this cultural moment, we are drowning in information but starving for wisdom mm. on how to process mm. it and how to walk into every sector of our lives um, with these Jesus lenses on. And as N.T. Wright, the scholar says, to think Christianly about our world and our lives. And so I was having these conversations that I, they're just fun for me to blend music, pop culture, politics, climate change, Jesus, Bible, Old Testament, you know, all these kind of things. And I'm like, yeah. we should put a microphone on these things. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, my, and the heart behind that was just to let the skeptic or someone who's seeking about faith realize that they're not crazy. And, yeah. uh, and then also to help the, the Christ follower process and walk differently th- yeah. to, towards yeah. all those yeah, things yeah. and to engage culture, yeah. Yeah. not to sit on the sidelines and critique it and throw stones, but to engage it with the way of Jesus yeah. instead yeah. of just doing the culture wars kind of thing that I'm just not a fan of and I don't find it to be productive. So uh, we say on the show mm-hmm. that we want to help people think wider so that they can love deeper mm-hmm. and ultimately so they can partner with God to bring the up there down here to bring the mm-hmm. life and the energy of heaven to our everyday world. Mm. And uh, if we can just widen the conversation so that we can you know, walk humbly and be more empathetic and love um, deeper, man, that's a good goal to have. So we love doing that. I think so many things that maybe I see on the internet or social media or even sometimes in conversation with other Christians, they're like, uh, you know, the next difficult political or tragic societal thing and and there's been a lot of that, right? Yeah. And people are like, "Jesus, come now!" And the, and it's more like this: <laughs> "Get me out of here!" Evacuation, yeah. you yeah. know, yes. like get me get me out of here. And I think that you know Tim Mackey kind of riffing on mm. his sort of stuff. Like, there's so much that we're like, "Get me get me the hell out of here!" <laughs> like mm-hmm. like this world, this earth, like mm-hmm. it's broken, it's messed up. I'm ready for heaven, and so much of that, like no, like we are here. To, to bring heaven on earth as, as people who are participating in the kingdom of God and to literally eradicate, get the hell out, out of this us. earth, out right? Of out of us, world, yeah. out of this That's world. That's the Jesus of, mission. Oh, you're preaching now and, on the and, podcast. And, come on, bring them on. And I think that, that shift um, in, in our mindset and how we relate to God and his kingdom and our role yeah. in it, because um, he... He, he's big. <laughs> he don't he don't need us, no, but he invites us. To he invites us into this mission, this collaborative mission that he's saying, "I'm giving you permission to be my agents of change." In that way, mm-hmm. it's such a beautiful thing, and it's sometimes we just have to like 
wake up and and see ourselves in the mirror the right way and um and and how God sees us and the permission he's giving us because I think our world like you're talking about I love that you guys are addressing some of these things because these are those spaces that are so difficult yeah. just to navigate as a person let alone it, at, as a church entity, right? To yeah. uh, how do you address these? Mm-hmm. How do you serve in these things yeah. and all this? And I think what you've done is you found this really great um, um, channel and avenue through Atypical Talk podcast to uh, broach those because they're things that people are thinking. You yeah. know, they're things that we're people are facing in the everyday and wondering about. And what does it mean to? Um, wow, I disagree with that. But what does it mean to do that in a way that is um, empathetic? Yeah. But also not compromising of my convictions exactly, and, yeah. and all these things. It's both so. of those things. I think one of the conversations that I'm willing to give my life for is how do we turn the Christian story, the Christian message away from evacuation, mm-hmm. yeah. get me out of here, mm-hmm. to re- joining and partnering with God for restoration. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, I'm going to pour my energy and my heart and my passion into every avenue I can to change that conversation so that outsiders looking at faith don't see it. They're just trying to get out of here. Right. But they want to be more about the common good and mm. restoring mm-hmm. God's good creation in our everyday lives. Well, and, I, and I think that compartmentalization that you talked about about the sacred and secular um that concept even the word secular <laughs> to people who aren't <laughs> it, yeah. like you know church going folk are like what are you talking about yeah, man? yeah man. Right. and um and you know martin luther he, he, now people wanted to get after martin luther for a lot of things and he was by no means a perfect man <laughs> but <laughs> did shape a lot of that protestant movement yeah. and a, a lot of what he talks to, talked about and some of the things that people wanted to kill him over as well was he talked about the that there is one estate, not a spiritual and a temporal estate. Yeah. And so he and people thought that it was a threat of the power of the Catholic Church, um, and saying, No, 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 like the priesthood of all believers and we're all everything that we're doing is is matters to God. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whether this mm-hmm. guy's working in the farm or whether he's working, you know, at this market or whatever it might be, or in the church, great. Mm-hmm. Um, but it all matters to him. And so I think the, the, the rich tradition that I think sometimes that we forget, um, that I think is even mirrored so clearly in the New Testament, that like all of it's God's, and it's, yeah. it's all his, mm-hmm. and everything is, you know, um, matters to him and how we go about it is significant. And so there's, you know, the fact that you're, and I think for a lot of my life, I believed subconsciously that my calling was higher than somebody else's because I worked in a local church. Yeah. Like, and I would preach a sermon that said, no, the no, no, opposite, you felt your it. mission matter. But like, there was this part <laughs> that you're like, no, but I was one of the few that's on this church staff and oh, this yeah, and that. And, Everybody and, else is and, muggles. And, 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 <laughs> and, and these last... <laughs> I've heard so. I've had a pastor tell me that before. And, like, and these, oh, what is happening? In no, these last, no. you know, um, these last four years, um, being outside of quote unquote local church ministry, yeah. I feel like I'm more mission centered, Jesus centered. Um, walking with Christ more than ever. And I'm like, how many people did I probably overlook because I thought Mm. if you were a pastor, then that was like premier calling. But it's like, no, no, no. It's just the role to play in God's kingdom. And and, and how we... Because things like loving people, guiding them towards truth, um, you know, I think Joel's a great person to do that with and for you. But also... Alex can do that. Yes. I can do that. Yeah. And this person over here. Well, can do we're, that. It's all our. It's and all it's, our. It's we're permission all that we're given to, 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 yeah. to do that. Yeah. It might yeah. look differently, but we're all called yeah. to it. I think that's one of the beautiful things that you do with your nonprofit and with your organization and what you're doing with this podcast is that uh, you're cutting down that barrier and you're letting everybody know that no, you have a part to play. Yeah. In the common good, you have a part to play in leading. Um, whatever that looks like, your yeah. family, your organization, uh, the thing that you're wanting to build. And so I appreciate that because I think that's part of what God is doing. And yeah. God wants us to cultivate this mm. world and to bring goodness and light mm. and life to it. Mm-hmm. And so we all have a part to play in that. It just might look different. And I just I want to join what you guys are doing and Thanks, partner man. with God to keep doing that kind yeah. of thing. Love that. That's so good. So Joel, as we start to wrap up uh, our conversation, which I don't want to leave because it's so good, but as we wrap up, what is a book, a podcast, something that you have just been reading, listening to lately that you could share with our listeners that's been a, a big inspiration, a big mm. motivation for you? Yeah, um, I think the most recent book that really <laughs> rang my bell um, mm. and had me really thinking a lot about what I do in leadership was a book um, by Scott McKnight. 
um, called a church called Tov. Mm-hmm. Tov mm-hmm. is the Hebrew word for good, mm-hmm. and um, it spoke into a lot of the culture that was built around church in America, mm-hmm. the big evangelical machine, and mm-hmm. spoke to some of the things that I think subconsciously were built that were just not like Jesus, um, some power dynamics that mm. were just dis- disruptive mm. and just dis- dis- destructive um, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in talking about how the church should be the model of goodness in this world. Mm. And so it's, it's challenged my leadership and mm. how we structure our church. Um, and I think mm. even if you're not a church leader in that sphere, um, you know, it really showed and put a light on what we're called to do and the yeah. goodness that we're supposed to do in our this, the small relationships and leading a team and in building towards something. Yeah. Understanding uh, your identity in the proper place yeah. is not a what you do. It's mm. deeper than that. It's yeah. who you are. Um, so it was beautifully challenging um, to me. Um, mm. And so just thinking about what I'm trying to build for and uh, the kind of culture that I'm building. Yeah. So it's, I think it's a powerful book no matter what sphere that you're well, in. Well, and I think yeah. that build for is so key because I think, you know, rightfully so, there's a lot of things in society and the evangelical church that is being deconstructed and rightfully so. And, yep. and you hear that, you know, phrase very commonly, but like, what are we building towards now, right? Yeah. It's And it's okay to look at things, but are we just leaving all these segmented, fragmented, broken pieces or seeing the beauty of like, what are we building towards? What are we joining in? Yeah. What can we acknowledge that's broken, but still like belong to and be a yeah. part of and redeem? And uh, I think that book too is like, it, it. you know, whether you're a church leader or just had proximity or curiosity of like the local church and yeah. saying, hey, here's some things that have pr- pr- we've probably gotten wrong, yeah. but here's some things to aspire yes. towards and forward. And the yep. book does w- both well. Yeah. yeah. That's good, man. Joel, how do people find you? How do you, they find what you're involved with at Bridgeway Church in Kokomo with Atypical Talk podcast or other ways just to connect with you, man? Yeah, I'm on social in a couple different places. Um, just Joel Larison, uh, J O E L L A R I S O N. Early at, adopter, got well, the full name. I there. got the full name. I didn't have to put numbers or anything. Well done. On Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and you can find the Atypical Talk podcast just by typing in Atypical Talk and wherever you get your podcast or the Bridgeway Church sermons, just Bridgeway Church Kokomo and your podcast as well. And you can find what we're doing on our website, bridgewaycokomo.com. Awesome, Joel. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for hanging out with us, man, today. And we want to say thank you to all of you for tuning in to this episode of the 4 Everyday Leaders podcast by Wayfinders. We hope it helps you lead in the everyday space of the moments of life. Yeah, and we would love for you to continue to join us on the journey of this podcast. You can subscribe to the 4 Everyday Leaders podcast by Wayfinders on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, and YouTube. Joel, thanks so much, dude. So good to catch up with you again. So good to be together. Our dear friend, Joel. Dear Dear friend. Dear friend, Joel. Love it.